So we're here with the infamous Max Kaiser of the Kaiser Report. Thank you for giving us a bit of time. Today. Blake, my pleasure. Glad you were coming here and we could hook up. So I've read Umpire my film recently. Uh, you were explaining about a theory you have about pure economics. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned photosynthesis and uh, kind of imply a kind of uh, an energy exchange there. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right, I call that pure price economics. And the quest since uh, the Enlightenment, since the modern age of economics, since Adam Smith, is to find a system to create prices that just are distributed throughout the economy for maximum benefit for everyone in the economy. And all the architecture and, and, and market structures we have today are an attempt to get to that place. But a lot of them now, it, here in the 21st century, they're woefully inadequate. And so you have uh, massive gaming of the system. You have high frequency trading, which is just gaming the system. You're just uh, stealing money from the system. Price discovery, as we know, it has collapsed. You have uh, a proliferation of fiat currency now around the world, hundreds of trillions, quadrillions of derivatives. So the whole market making mechanism, price discovery mechanism has collapsed. And when you look around to nature, and this is what Adam Smith did when he was coming up with ideas for his ideas about economics, you find that there are perfect markets that I would call frictionless markets almost, uh, pure price markets. And one example I give is photosynthesis, essentially, where we've got uh, the green leaf of the plant is doing ex an exchange of uh, you know, oxygen for uh, carbon uh, dioxide. So uh, this is happening photosynthetically. Mm. And uh, so it's a market. And it's happening in a way that's mutually beneficial for all parties. And um, I think that especially now in the digital age, we can get closer to something like that because the cost of electrons, which is the, the, the stuff of this electronic economy, is virtually zero. Mm. So I think we can get to that place. And, and so it requires new, new engineering, new thinking, new, new, new analysis, new, new markets, et cetera. And Bitcoin, I think, is a really interesting part of that evolution because it fits in in terms of a currency that is um, frictionless in a lot of ways and has a lot of attributes that fit into this emerging paradigm, if you will, of, of, a, of, yeah. a, of a new way to, to make markets. So I guess in that way, Bitcoin can kind of be thought of <coughs> in, in, a, in an organic sense, like a, an auxin in a plant that, that, carries, um, that carries the necessary sugars and things to the leaves and then carries the manufactured sugars back down to the roots and Whereas fiat currency would be more like a poison to the plant that's killing it off. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good, yeah. Once you get into the natural world, the, the, the analogies are you know, right easy there. to spot because yeah. you see it all around us. And, and I would agree with that. The, as a medium of exchange, the plant has to move you know, elements around that plant and it needs to do so using some medium of exchange. And so it has developed various ways to do that that are for the most part invisible. But now we're, we're probing deeply into that into the natural look into, into the into the this, what do you want to call it the 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 so-called real economy the global economy that's a goal but it's uh, it's extremely uh, clumsy and awkward and the, the result is is bad is to not only do you have a destruction of economies destruction of societies but you also have destruction of nature as a result of this horrible outdated design yeah you have uh, recently minted the the new silver Kaisers. Yes, I have one with me. Oh, you yes. Got one with you, great. <laughs> yes, I happen to have one. This is. <laughs> yes. Is. Now, what is it about this that is ethically sound? I notice it says uh, it's recycled. Yeah. So, how do they go about that? Is that scraping up from the road from the cars going by? Or? <laughs> <laughs> recycled silver refers to silver that's uh, coming out of people's um, out of their their flatware and uh, jewelry and things like that. It's, it's, um, it, it's, there's a huge uh, amount of this silver that's out there and it's hard to uh, quantify it exactly. But the silver is pretty tight on the supply side. There's only about a billion ounces above ground. You know, it's a, it's a metal that's used industrially. Unlike gold where it's, all, it's never uh, used. It's, you know, they, all the 160,000 tons of gold that have been mined over the past 5,000 years, it's still kind of above ground and people still have that somewhere. It's not being thrown away like silver. It, it's in electronic devices and other devices. It gets thrown away. It's in landfills. And, and so, uh, or it's 
hard to keep track of because it's in jewelry, flatware, cutlery, things like that. So um, there's a huge amount of this scrap silver, you could call it. So this new Silver Kaiser is going to source uh, scrap silver or recycled silver, as well as silver from mines that would carry an ESG, the Environmental Social Governments label that the UN comes up with under that social responsibility initiative. And this will become very important going forward because corporations with huge cash balances are going to be concerned increasingly with, the f with how very central banks are debasing their currency. And they're going to look to gold and silver as a, as a way to park cash. Because corporations have huge amounts of cash on their balance sheet. Apple Computer being a prime example. I think they have $120 billion in cash. And now if the governments are going to be debasing the value of that cash, they're going to look for a way to hedge that or to protect themselves, especially since they use silver in their ongoing business. So when they come to the silver market and they start buying silver, they're going to be under laws put out by the UN under corporate governance laws. They're going to be compelled by legally to look for socially responsible sources of silver. So we have a, an institutional product, $500,000 minimum, for corporations who will be able to park cash in metals, in silver and gold. Um, and again, that's putting huge pressure on the supply of silver and gold, which is one of our objectives, mm -hmm. to uh, transfer wealth back from the banks that have systemically stolen trillions to, to put that back into the pockets of people by putting silver in their pockets first, and then as the price appreciates, then the banks are getting increasingly more trouble. They'll continue to print more money to try to bail themselves out of trouble, which increases the value of silver and gold. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the process, with silver at $500 an ounce, gold at $10,000 an ounce, uh, you know, we have the capital, we've got the money, and they're facing the problems. Yeah. You seem to have the ability to keep a, a strong sense of humor and a positive outlook, even amongst all this uh, suffering, all this trouble that you're constantly exposed to. What's your formula? How do you stay on, on top? Well, you know, uh, truth be told, I started out in the late 70s as a stand-up comedian. Yeah. That was my one of my first jobs, you know. I actually, my job before that, going back to the mid-70s when I was still a teenager, was as a street magician in Manhattan. And I worked the matinees shows from Broadway, so people would come out of the shows uh, the mat for the lunch, for the, um, you know, the break in, yeah. in a show. Um, and I would do, be doing uh, magic there in, in Times Square. But like card tricks? Uh, Rope trick, card trick, linking rings, uh, classic kind of street magic yeah. act, sponge balls. <laughs> and um, then, and then I was also doing comedy as well. And I was doing when I was at, I was at New York University. I was studying comedy, um, radio, television. It was really, uh, really, because I, I was just looking for a job, any job. I ended up working for a broker on Wall Street, and then this started my Wall Street career. So um, I have, you know, carried my that through my entire career. You know this. Uh, you know, my, my, my kind of, uh, my, 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 my instincts and, and my background doing performing and stuff like that. So I try to bring that to this space, which, which is good because nobody currently in this space of finance and economic reporting really has any sense of humor at all. You know, they, they, they're very, uh, they, they tend toward orthodoxy. They tend yeah. toward rigidity in their thinking. You get a couple of diamonds in the rough, like, uh, for instance, Matt Taibbi and a couple of, a couple of people out there. Interesting with Matt Taibbi, who is certainly the best writer in the space. Uh, you know, he comes out of following sports, and I think in sports, you know, you have the referee, you have the umpire, you have the final score. You have there's a certain, uh, you know, justice, if you will, in sports. It's very you, you and, and people understand this. So he brings that thinking to finance space, and he's outraged that the total lack of referee, total lack of of any kind of oversight. The, the ability you know to for, for these bankers to, to operate without any uh, accountability whatsoever yeah. so but he brings that kind of sports writing um, panache uh, to that to the to the finance space and he also has a very interesting background even going before that he was uh, he started a, a very independent magazine uh, he was co-founder of a magazine in, in Moscow right after the uh, Berlin Wall came down and he had um, it's a fascinating story and yeah. he, he developed this style which is fantastic and and again, it's very difficult to write about markets and finance because it's it's meant to be obfuscation 
It's meant to be confusing. It's meant to be jargon filled. It's meant to be a code uh, to, to keep the, the lay person yeah, out. It's so like Christianity in that respect. I loved your euphemisms going back to uh, Ireland. I forget where it was. Kilkenny, was it that you mm, did? Mm -hmm. And during that time, and in, in the Kaiser reports, you were talking a lot about the similarities between the Christian kind of dogmas and the financial dogmas, if you like. Uh, you know, talking about Ireland, it's funny because, you know, the, the Murphy Report in Ireland, which is the exposing the pedophile uh, ring in the Irish Catholic Church, uh, has resulted in the Irish government, for example, closing their embassy in the Vatican. And the popular uh, sentiment toward uh, priests and the church is negative. You know, if you talk to people in Ireland now, they're very negative on the church. Mm. But, you know, in my, in my opinion, if you look at a guy like Sean Fitzpatrick from Anglo-Irish Bank, who committed vastly, you know, uh, uh, scandalous, uh, reckless devastation. financial trans yeah. devastation, you know, he, he should also deserve the same kind of outrage from the public. They're, they're, they're similar in a lot of ways. What is it that causes people to have this confusion between what's fake and what's real? So if you want to talk about religion, if you want to talk about finance, why is it that we have such a, is it, I think it's propaganda. Your thoughts? Well, I think that people are easily taken in by the cult of of, uh, of, money, of bankers, the banking cult, and the, the cult of what I call price propaganda, essentially. And there's a um, there's an effort, let's say, in the U.S. If you if you look at the financial press in the U.S., CNBC, if the markets are going up, that's always a good thing, and that every there should be. Everything should be attempted to, to prevent the markets from going down, and that higher prices are good. And, but there's no, but that's not true. Higher prices can be very destructive if you're if you're capitalizing uh, companies that are that are that are causing huge social harm. That's not a good thing. Like, for example, Corrections Corps of America is a private prison operator. The stock's trading at new highs all the time because they're getting local states in America to give them the business of running prisons. In exchange, the company is getting the states to sign contracts that guarantee 90% occupancy of those prisons. Yeah. So they, they're building a gulag state society. So the, the price of the stock is higher, but you're building a gulag state. So that, that's... Like planet Earth is a finite, sort of closed system, at least for now. We don't need infinite growth. Right, so that, that's right. So you have finite resources, so ever higher prices mean that eventually you're, you're, you're going to end up completely um, without any natural resources at all, and, yeah. and there's a total collapse. So that, that, but the, the propaganda is higher prices are always good, yeah. more money is always good, net worth going higher is always good, and that's just part of the, the culture. It's become part of the, 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 the mindset, and uh, especially in the U.S., which is a huge player in the global economy, and that's, that's, it's a cult, basically. Did you uh, watch Zeitgeist Moving Forward yet? I know you were in it. <laughs> I, I promised I would watch it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I read the Wikipedia entry. Does that count? <laughs> I think if I understand it correctly. So, and I, I had a couple of email exchanges actually with the uh, producer or director of the film oh, after really? that. And um, we, were, we were talking about, because he, he, I believe, you know, he was saying that there's no case to be made for money at all. You, you can't have money. It's just an economy based purely on natural resources. And um, I, I'm not convinced by that idea. I think money is a useful way to exchange, as a medium of exchange. Uh, it has to be adapted to so that it, it works sustainably and, and within the context of, a, of an economy that's going to be growing in ways that are not suicidal. But you know, he, he just doesn't see that as being a possibility. He thinks once you go, once you open the door to money, think about money in some way, you know, you just it's impossible to, to not head into the direction of where we are now. Yeah. So, so, you know, his ideas are, they're somewhat utopian that, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's, you know, it's possible to do something like that. I, I just don't think it's, I think it's more efficient to just come up with a better money, yeah. you know, b better currencies, but different at, currencies. But what cost though, if I, if I can interject. So you'll have 
uh, somebody who wants to create something, but if they want to create something, if their motivation is fear, so the fear of like, oh, I better create something, otherwise I might not get fed, otherwise I'm going to be socially orchestrated, otherwise I'm going to be homeless on the street, ostracized. Sorry, it's the second time I've made this, that mistake during this conference. But um, as opposed to the motivation being, not to sound like a hippie, but I can't think of any other way to put it, but as opposed to the motivation being... Uh, well, love, love for what you're doing, love for your community, and uh, sort of, and created in this sort of, with uh, this feeling of trust that you're going to get that kind of unconditional love from your community back. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, if, I, if I understand the question, uh, the question is, um, you know, one of the problems with money is that it breeds a certain pathological greed yes. where the goal of just acquiring money for the sake of acquiring money is the, it, 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 it becomes um, you know uh, overrides any uh, anything else that that uh, and and including something as basic as uh, empathy or love or something like this so you, you crowd out these these things by, by, by pursuit of, of, of cash and um, you know this is of course an idea that comes up repeatedly that in in a capitalist society it it tends to favor greedy people and the greedy people say well yes we're very wealthy but you know we provide jobs there's a trickle down uh, and um, it it's, uh, inspires entrepreneurialism and if you don't have that market working in that way and you rely on a central authority to well, that's completely wrong, of course, because it's not the upper class who provide their jobs, but rather the middle class. Well, right, uh, understood. But this is this is the this is the, the propaganda that, yeah. that that we hear, and they and by the people who own most of the media, and so they have a very integrated way to push that propaganda. So my my thoughts on this would basically be that what what happens is that as one acquires wealth, as one acquires money, the risk of acquiring additional capital goes down. So once you have, let's say, $5 million, you can then start hiring lawyers to reduce your tax liability, to write legal opinions, to exempt you from other taxable liabilities, various taxable liabilities. You have the ability to lobby politicians and participate in lobbying of politicians to change laws that are favorable to you aggregating more wealth. So once you hit a certain threshold of wealth, the, the ability to then go up that scale becomes exponentially easier because you are removing something very fundamental to any economic system, and that is risk. Yeah. So the way I address this problem, think about this problem, is that you've got to maintain risk in every economic strata. And one way that I think you could reintroduce risk to, let's say, the Fortune 400 is to introduce something that I call the humble games. Yeah, because what's what's missing in that strata is humility, and humility is a basic human trait, basic human characteristic. But once you have a certain net worth, and you can buy politicians and buy your way through to to, to and, and commit illegal acts. I mean, the people on Wall Street commit fraud. Their attitude is, well, we'll commit the fraud today, and if we get caught, we'll just have them change the law. So they're acting completely outside of the law because they have the capital to do so. But this idea of the humble games would be you take the Fortune 400, and every year you have a, let's say, a reverse lottery, and maybe 20 or 50 of the names are completely stripped of all their wealth. They're made paupers overnight. Now this would introduce risk and introduce humility, because of this class of, of, uh, of the, uh, you know, the, the unaccountable, the unaccountable wealthy, they would know that, you know, I should be a little bit more humble because in another six months is the humble games and I might be pauperized. So maybe, you know what, life is short. You know, they begin to think in a different way. They, they, they lose their shield of Im, Im, immunity because that's what happens once you get it to a certain level. You're, you're completely immunized against any accountability at all. And that, that, that needs to be broken apart and there needs to be, risk has to be in every aspect of the economy. There needs to be risk yeah. as, as a entrepreneur just starting out there needs to be a risk for a Warren Buffett as well Warren Buffett has no risk whatsoever George Soros has no risk whatsoever he'll tell you he's taking risks and he but he doesn't really take any risks I mean he, he may and, and the same is true for 
that, that class, the Fortune 400. So that's something that, you know, one idea to, to it and reimpose risk. And it, it would readjust people's priorities and, and, and readjust people's thinking so that a lot of people who make lots of money, they, it's not because they want to make lots of money for its own sake necessarily, but they just want to make more than the next guy. So, you know, like Bill Gates and Larry Ellison, they're multi-billionaires. Larry Ellison, his driving force is to someday have more money than Bill Gates. It's kind of but, like this ludicrous, arguably upward spiral of competition. Right, but it doesn't do anything for the overall economy or society or banking or it, it's, it's very destructive. If you have these two billionaires who are, who are just at it, you know, fighting each other this, this Making game. the world their playground. Right, and it doesn't doesn't add anything. Now, if you had if you added this humble games risk element, that you know one day you know, Larry Ellison could be stripped of 100 percent of his wealth. Well, he, first of all, he's got to go to his friends. That he, so he should be nicer to his friends all, all along the way because you never know when you have to go back to those people and ask them now to I'm a pauper. Can you help me? So it, it makes them, you know, uh, a lot more uh, friendly. Uh, they they have to then, you know, there's a lot of benefits to it. Yeah. And um, so I think that's the missing element is risk. Risk should be present in every strata of economic activity. And um, that's my answer to that. <laughs> yeah. How do you get to that point where you have some, some creative initiatives being taken up that, that involve uh, these, these effectively sociopaths? I mean, how could that happen? You know, these people are so guarded against ever having to be humble and these have all these institutions and organizations surrounding them where's the weakness like it's silver I guess it is silver. right well you know i looked at it quite carefully and silver is definitely a weakness and it's something where the, the jp morgan you know when they bought up bear stearns they inherited this huge naked silver short position and by taking silver off the market you're you're putting pressure on them the price goes up the, the bank itself just revealed you know huge losses on the balance sheet in London because they're trying to move stuff around to cover these losses so we're definitely having an impact on that yeah. so it's tough to get people to, to have a sustained campaign over time because people you know they get bored quickly so even though that campaign launched in 2010 November 2010 and took the price of silver from 25 to 50 you know then people got bored with it and, and they because they're just being bombarded with sensations constantly. And um, the fact is that the global community can take the price to 500. They don't have to stop at 50. They can take it to 500 if they want yeah. to. And uh, therefore, they would all have this transference of wealth to them. Yeah. And they would put these bankers out of business. But they're living within you know a bubble of propaganda that comes to them from the corporate-owned media, the bankers themselves, et cetera. So it's very difficult to think. You know, in, in, in outside of that that bubble, you talk about the activist, <clears throat> the, for, uh, the protester, the demonstrator, who really doesn't want to succeed, and who really thrives more from the act of rebellion than actually succeeding against their oppressors. It's my feeling that occasionally, even you fall into that bracket by vilifying and ridiculing people who really need care, mental health care. <laughs> uh -huh. Your thoughts. <laughs> If I understand the question correctly, you're, you're suggesting that people who work on Wall Street, who are sociopaths, they, they should be cared for in a mental institution and not be kicked in the face on, on television. Precisely, yeah. Like you, it's, a, it's a very dark side of comedy that you get up on stage. And what drives you? Aren't you afraid of some of these people? You're exposing them in the light, and they're very dangerous psychopathic people in general. Mm -hmm. what, keeps you, what keeps you coming out every week? And harassing them? Uh, well, for one thing, there, there has been no change in their, in their uh, ability to operate and their upward trajectory of their wealth. So on that, on that front, I have been completely ineffective. I, if any of these people suffered any losses, they might be upset and they might okay. react. But so far, there hasn't been any. You know, some people who go after let's say they're more political they go after politicians and if they have a if they in a politician suffers a reputational damage then the, the politician becomes vindictive and these activists become like let's say uh, um, you know Jeremy Scahill who would go after Blackwater you know who's a mercenary yeah. for hire they you changed know. their name recently yeah they change their name all the time they, all the time. So, but he has a real impact on the way the public perceives him, and because the, 
politically, they rely on government contracts, and so that, so so he actually is more on the line of fire. Now, by me going after Jamie Dimon, has it had any impact on their business whatsoever? Not at all. So they're not going to. Well, I just heard through Reuters that they're coming up on charges of money laundering. Uh, J.P. Morgan. I saw that on their Twitter feed, but of course, it's just overheads, I suppose, when you're dealing with a company like J.P. Morgan with these fines. Well, they, they, if you look at the last five, ten years, they have they've been paid many multiple hundred million dollar fines for multiple infractions. They'll, yeah, so what? They'll, they'll pay a fine. As they'll long, move on. As long as each of these cases gets treated as a sort of isolated incident. And every, you know, the thing about the, the broker of dentistry, having worked in the broker of dentistry myself, one of the first things they tell you is you can't really get in trouble. You can do anything you want because when people sign that new account form, they sign off on binding arbitration before a panel of brokers and bankers. It never goes to a jury. Yeah. Less than 2% of all claims against the industry results in any kind of monetary compensation. So you can literally forge documents. You can... Um, muck around in people's accounts doing all kinds of unlimited un unauthorized trading you can um, you can do anything you want there's, there's no there's no limits there's no law and if anyone and as you get up higher up in the hierarchy to the people who own the, the big fan the big firms when they do a massive money laundering scheme multi hundred billion dollar money laundering scheme well then if that is exposed they get the government to change the law so um, Oh, they pay a small fine. Okay, HSBC and and uh, Wachovia, which is not part of Wells Fargo, were both caught laundering over four hundred billion dollars for Mexican drug cartels. They were caught red-handed, so they didn't have to admit guilt. They paid a fine, and that's it. How much would it cost to employ as kind of a mercenary group of? Um demonstrators to walk down to a big HSBC in the city and just like have a, a sit-in where they kind of through placing their physical bodies inside the premises stop that uh, organization from being able to function from that building could you just pay people who really have no interest in it just a hundred or a couple of hundred to go and sit down there is there a viable way of so start people from entering yeah, because I know there was the Occupy movement and they try and go to the Bank of England and different places, and, but it's so hard to actually stop these institutions from functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I've been talking with a few people here about non-violent sabotage, and that sounds like an oxymoron to most people, but I mean, without harming people, sabotaging the activities of, say, the Bank of England, um, it sounds kind of militant. I like that, non-violent sabotage. We're going to write that down. Oh, good. I'm glad that's starting to catch up. <laughs> I'll have to use that. <laughs> um, could a, could a, um, a guy such as yourself bankroll mm -hmm. an operation like that? Well, as you point out, the, the Occupy Wall Street movement was a, people protesting and demonstrating and blocking entrances and doing things like that, but it just doesn't work. And um, anything in the physical space I don't think is, is going to work. And that's why I prefer the campaigns like the, the Buy Silver campaign. And, or, you know, I had a campaign a few years ago against Coca-Cola, you know, to boycott Coca-Cola to try to drive the stock lower and then get hedge funds to sell it short to attack it. And then that would be a self-feeding yeah. phenomenon. And then get a hedge fund set up to short Coke stock and use the proceeds from the, from the sale of the, of the, you know, covering the short sale, the profits to uh, assist victims of Coke in India or Colombia, these places. And, you know, we had it for a year. Had it, it was in a magazine here, the, the Ecologist magazine. We, we had that for a year. We got a lot of press. The right wing attacked it because they realized it was dangerous. If actually people embraced this, it would, it would really be dangerous. But, and it gets back to your original question, the, the activists themselves, they don't want to win necessarily. They want to they live, you know, what they consider to be a morally... Uh, outstanding life yeah. see they 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 don't want to win necessarily they don't want to actually do what it takes to to beat the bad guys they just want to kind of be on the sidelines and say you know what they suck i'm going to live in this way that's morally acceptable i'm not going to this i'm not going to do business with them but i'm not going to take them on and actually fight to win uh so there's just not enough people out there who are in the category of fight to win there's a huge 
extremely poor population that is just worried about day-to-day -day sustenance. So they're not going to be in joining any fight other than the fight to stay alive another day. Then you have middle-class people that are aspiring to be in the upper class. You know, then you have another group of people that kind of fall in between, and there's just not enough of them. I mean, that, that's the group of people traditionally that cause revolutions. If you go back to the American Revolution, the, the U.S., the, the founding fathers were not poor people. They were middle-class people, well-off people, but they didn't want to be occupied anymore by British monarchy, so they had a revolution. So these people, these middle-class people around the world, at some point they're going to be, we don't want to be occupied by bank bankers anymore, so we're going to have to you know, have a revolution.